All right now we're going to um, discuss completeness and why completeness gives you things like uh, roots. Okay, remember uh, geometrically you had this completeness axiom which said that every non-empty set which is bounded above has a uh, least upper bound and if it's bounded below it has a greatest lower bound. Uh, this is why roots exist and this was discussed in the book. I want to just give a little more informal uh, discussion. Completeness says that essentially that the real line has no holes. Okay, so if you look at the graph of x squared, um, I mean x to the uh, fifth minus seven, that um, graph is right below, and um, you see what it does. Uh, if x is equal to zero, it's down on at minus seven, and then if x is uh, something bigger, pretty large, it's up here positive. So it has to go from here up to here, and since the real numbers have no holes in them, there must be something there that this graph encounters. All right. Well, when it when this is equal to zero, then by definition, that point on the number line would be the fifth root of seven. Okay, so that's that's why we have roots essentially. Now here's another example. Uh, the square root of two is irrational. Um, why? Well, if it were rational, then the square root of two would be the quotient of two integers. And you could uh, reduce these to uh, lowest terms. Okay, and that's what we'll do. So if it is a rational number, then it's it's the quotient of two integers where the rational number is reduced to lowest terms. So now if I square both sides, I get two times q squared is p squared. So that means that p squared has to be even because you see two divides the left, so two divides the right. Now that means in the prime factorization of p, there must be a two. So in fact, uh, p squared is divided by 4. So p squared is 4 times m, see, and where m is some integer. Now divide both sides by 2, and now we see that q squared is even, and so q must have 2 in its prime factorization. So that means the fraction wasn't in lowest terms after all. So this square root of 2 cannot be rational. Incidentally, this was discovered by the Greeks some 500 BC, and it was a very upsetting thing to them because they thought that they could express every point on the number line, every real number, or actually what they thought was if, if you could construct it, then it must somehow be rational, you see. And that wasn't true because they could construct the square root of 2. Okay, now, if the real line had only rational numbers, uh, the argument given above wouldn't work because you could look at the graph of x squared minus 2 and if x is 0 it starts off at negative 2, if x is 3 it goes up to 4, right? And, um, and then you'd ask, well, where will it intersect the real line? Well, if you only had rational numbers, there would be a hole where the square root of 2 was supposed to be, you see? And so this argument up here just wouldn't work at all. So why do we have roots? We have roots because the real line is complete. Now here's uh, something else. Uh, suppose s is this set, the closed interval. Uh, what's the supremum of s? It's 5, isn't it? 5 is an upper bound, and there is certainly no smaller upper bound. Now what is the upper bound to 2, 5, the interval, half open interval from 2 up to 5 where you leave off 5? Well, the supremum of s is still 5. It's an upper bound, and there's no smaller upper bound. You see? So that tells you that sometimes the supremum of a non-empty set is in the set, and sometimes the supremum is not in the set. Now, if you have a em the empty set, the concept of supremum and infimum aren't all that useful, because uh, you could conclude that uh, 7 is a lower bound. Why? Because it's smaller than everything in the set, right?
there isn't anything there. So 7 is certainly smaller than everything there. Similarly, so is 11. And so is, is uh, 100. And so you see, it doesn't really make much sense to think about supremum of s and infimum of s. All right, now what you can say though that is quite useful is that if you have a non-empty set and you have a and b are both equal to the supremum, then they have to be equal. Why? Well, since a is the supremum and b is an upper bound, it follows that a is smaller than or equal to b. Since b is the supremum and a is an upper bound, it follows that b is smaller than or equal to a, and therefore they're equal. Same thing holds for the infimum. So you see, the idea of a supremum, is, there's a single thing, it consists of a single number, and similarly for the infimum. Now, how do they relate to taking additive inverses? If you have a non-empty set, minus s denotes the set of additive inverses of things in s. How are infimum of minus s and supremum of s related? Well, here's a, a little picture that can sort of give you the idea of what's going on. You can prove this rigorously, but I think it's a little easier to look at the picture. Here's s, here's minus s. Suppose I want the infimum of minus s. It's down here, right there, see? And now, if I take minus that infimum, what would I get? I'd be picking up the supremum of s. So you see the supremum of s is equal to minus the infimum of minus s, or infimum of minus s is minus the supremum of s. Now, in an exactly similar way, the supremum of minus s is equal to minus the infimum of s. You factor out the minus sign and change soup to inf. That's about all you have to do. And here's uh, one can give a careful argument why that is true. You should you should do that if uh, you feel so inclined. All right, here's some other topics that are really not about completeness, but they're still interesting. Uh, if you look at a set that has n elements in it, all right, n elements, uh, how many subsets of that set are there? Well, there will always be two to the n including the empty set. The number of subsets is the sum of n things taking k at a time, from k equals 0 up to n. k equals 0 indicating the empty set. All right? And so then you could put 1 to the n minus k and 1 to the k here. So this is 1 plus 1 raised to the n. And that's why. All right? So there's going to be 2 to the n subsets of a given set. Here's another question. Is a plus b quantity to the n equal to a to the n to the b plus b to the n? Uh, yeah, sometimes. Uh, the only time that happens is when n is 1. <laughs> and if n is not 1, it doesn't happen. Okay? Uh, assuming these are both uh, positive real numbers or actually just uh, uh, non-zero numbers. Okay? Okay. Um, yeah, it just doesn't work unless unless n is 1. Uh, how about this? Well, this is just the case where n is a half, isn't it? And you can see that this will not be true if a and b are uh, not 0 uh, because you could square both sides, and on the right, you'd have 2 times a, b, and you wouldn't have that on the left. Okay, so if you have 1 of a and b equal to 0, yeah, then this will be true, but possibly. But in general, it won't be. Is it ever the case that 1 over x plus y is equal to 1 over... No. That's, that's never true. Everybody underst I hope everyone understands this, that you, you can see this is the case. If alpha and beta are roots of this... Okay, now we're going to go through a little uh, another treatment here of a formula for finding roots to quadratic equations. This is really cute. If alpha and beta are both roots, then you can factor this as x minus alpha times x minus beta. And so you get, when you multiply this out, you get this. So now if I look at this term, this this um, uh, ec this uh, coefficient here, the minus alpha plus beta has to be b. And so if I divide by 2, 
I see that minus b over 2 is the average of the roots. Therefore, the roots are minus b over 2 plus u or minus b over 2 minus u. Now I'm going to just find what u is. So I'm going to stick this in to the equation and multiply it all out and that gives me uh, this. And now I can, I can find what u is. u squared is b squared minus 4c over 4. So u would be plus or minus 1 half the square root of b squared minus 4c. And so I can, I can say that the solutions to this quadratic equation are minus b over 2 plus or minus 1 half the square root of b squared minus 4c. Now if you had something different than 1 here, <coughs> like an a, you could just divide by the a and get the same result holding. Okay, uh, it would be just a few more, it would be a little more elaborate expression, but the same idea would work. Now, let's go to trigonometry and complex roots. By de Moivre's theorem, if I take cosine of, um, of x plus i sine of x, and I raise that to the uh, nth power, that's equal to the cosine of nx plus i sine of nx. Now this is what de Moivre's theorem says. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is use de Moivre's theorem to derive a formula for the sine of 5x and one for the cosine of 5x. So I take a plus ib to the fifth, and if I multiply it out, I get this. You could use the Pascal triangle uh, um, method that I showed uh, about uh, earlier to obtain this. Just remember that i squared is always negative 1. And so when you do that, you get this expression. So now wherever I see an a, I'll put cosine of x. Wherever I see a b, I'll put sine of x. And then if I just plug that in, here is the cosine of 5x, here is the sine of 5x. So it's very easy to find those kinds of things. Um, now, you remember de Moivre's theorem says this, for, uh, and that's, that holds true if n is equal to 0, 1, 2, etc. My question is, does it also hold for negative integers? And the answer is, it does. Suppose then that you have n as a positive integer, and you take this thing and, uh, and you raise it to uh, the negative n power. So I have this thing to the minus n is defined to be this over n. Well, from de Moivre's theorem for positive n, I get this. And now I'll multiply on the top and on the bottom by this. And on the bottom, I'll get cosine squared plus sine squared, which is 1. And so that gives me this thing on the top. Now, I could just put this minus sign in here and put a negative n there. And I can replace this n with a negative n because the cosine is even. So you see, the de Moivre's theorem holds with no change for any integer, any integer at all. You'll get the uh, you'll get de Moivre's theorem. Okay, here's a complex number. Find its inverse. Well, its inverse is this. I multiply by the top and on the bottom by 5 minus 9i, and that gives me 25 plus 81 in the bottom, and that's 5 over 106 plus I mean minus 9 over 106 times i. Now here are the fourth roots of uh, x to the fourth plus 16. I know that negative 16, see I'm looking at the fourth roots of negative 16 because I want the complete solution, so I want to find all the roots. So I have negative 16 is equal to 16 cosine pi plus i sine of pi. And so the roots are, you take the fourth root of this, which is 2, and then the cosine of pi plus 2k pi over 4, same thing in here. And k goes from 0, 1, 2, and 3. Now if you if you just put in what you get there, uh, you find that these are the roots. Okay? Now, let's show that if z is a complex number, there exists a complex number with magnitude 1 such that, uh, called omega, such that omega times z is equal to absolute value of z. Well, if z is equal to 0, let omega equal 1. Otherwise, 
uh, you could just let, um, you know what it has to be. Omega has to be absolute value z divided by z, see? Well, I multiply by the complex conjugate on the top and on the bottom, and I get this. So this is what, this is what omega should be. So you can always do this. That's very useful. Now, if you multiply two complex numbers, and they are associated with the angle theta and phi, the thing you're, we're showing here is that it involves addition of the complex numbers. Now, I'm, I'm assuming these uh, complex numbers have um, uh, magnitude 1. If not, you just put an R here and something else there. Okay, so if I take, well, let's just do it, okay? Suppose z is r here, and then omega, uh, w is rho, all right? So then when I multiply them, I get r rho times this, and then I get all this stuff, and it times r rho, and then I would have, by using the... Uh, the trig identities, I would end up with this. And so now you see the angle associated with the product is the sum of the angles. Now you know exponents act like that. So you see angles are acting like exponents. See? All right, well, write x cubed plus 27 in the form x plus 3 times something where this cannot be factored anymore using only real numbers. Now, I know that um, if I was to factor this completely, I would have 3 as one of the uh, roots, uh, I mean minus 3 as one of the roots of minus 27, okay? Uh, because that sets ma makes this po polynomial equal to 0. The other two roots are going to be complex, okay? But to find this, all you have to do is just take x plus 3 and uh, divide it into this. So I put an x squared there, and then I have an x cubed plus 3x squared, subtract, minus 3x squared plus 0x. I put a minus 3x here, and that gives me minus 3x squared. Uh, let's see, minus 9x. I change the sign and add. 9x plus 27, I put plus... Uh, 9 here, and lo and behold, it works out. And so I have x plus 3 times this. Now you can just check, if you like, using the quadratic formula, that this will not have any real roots, this, this polynomial you just got. So there's no way you can factor it any further using real numbers. Okay, if you have a polynomial and z is a 0, suppose now that we've been using this for a little while. A little while. And now we're going to discuss it carefully. Suppose p of x is some polynomial and z is a 0. So that means what? A root or a 0. It means p of z equals 0. Show there's another polynomial q of x such that p of x is x minus z times q of x. Okay, that's how we can factor. If we know roots, we can factor the polynomial. Well, you know from the division algorithm for polynomials, there's a q of x such that p of x is q of x times x minus z plus r of x, where the degree of r of x is smaller than, than 1. So this has to be a constant. But if I plug in x equal to z here, 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 and here, I get p of z is 0, and so the constant has to be 0. And so p of x is equal to q of x times x minus z. Now, of course, you can continue doing this. You, you can look now for the roots of q of x. If q of something is 0, then from this relationship here, it follows that p of that thing will be 0. So you just keep on factoring until eventually you have factored q of x as far as you can go, and, and then you're, you're done, okay? Now, the fundamental theorem of algebra says that you can always factor it all the way into a product of polynomials that have degree 1. 
Okay, so here we're going to do that with this particular polynomial. So in order to do it, all I have to do is identify the fourth roots of 16, of minus 16. Well, I did that up here. There they are. And so from what we just discussed, a factorization of x to the fourth plus 16 is right here. These here are the roots. This one, this one, this one, and this one. Those are the roots. Now, if you look at this, the product of these two uh, degree one polynomials has real coefficients. Now, how do I know that? Well, because these two roots here, this one and this one, are complex conjugates of each other. So when I look at the mixed term, when I multiply it out, is it will involve the real part of one of these. See? And so it'll be real. And then when I multiply complex conjugates by each other, I get something real. So the first two is this. You can't factor it any further in terms of real numbers. The product of the second two is here. That one will not factor any further in terms of real numbers. But I have factored x to the fourth plus 16 as a product of two irreducible over the real numbers polynomials, this one and this one. Now, this would be one of the steps to using partial fractions later when you factor the bottom in terms of irreducible quadratics. Now, another one, another thing that you should notice is that when you have a real polynomial, so all of these a sub k's are real numbers, then if you have p of z equal to 0, it follows that p of z conjugate is 0 also. Now, this is very easy to see, because if I take p of z and it equals 0, then its conjugate is 0, see? So this thing will be 0. And now, if I take the conjugate of this expression, it would be the, the sum of the conjugates. And each of those terms is the product of the conjugates. And since the coefficients are real, the conjugate of these coefficients is just the coefficient itself. And so you end up with p of z conjugate here. And as I mentioned, that's 0 because it's the conjugate of p of z, see? So what that tells you is that when you have real polynomials, the uh, roots occur in conjugate pairs. Now, show that any real polynomial can always be theoretically factored as a product of irreducible quadratics in degree one polynomials. OK, this is very easy. If the polynomial has any real roots, say z, you look at x minus z, and it divides the polynomial. So you can say the polynomial is x minus z times some other polynomial q of x. And you can just keep doing that until you run out of real roots. Now you go to the complex roots. By what we just discussed, if you have a complex root, uh, its complex conjugate is also a root. And so if I look at z minus w times z minus w conjugate, where w and w conjugates are the, uh, a root and its complex conjugate, which is also a root, then if I multiply it out, I get, I get this. See? Because the mixed term will be w, w conjugate plus w, w conjugate, and that's uh, uh, the conjugate of w, w conjugate, and that's the real part of this thing, see? So it'll be some real number here, and so you'll have all real coefficients, okay? But you can't, you cannot factor it further because to factor it further, you'd have to use these complex numbers. So every time you see a complex root, it with its complex conjugate will deliver an irreducible quadratic polynomial that will factor, be a factor of your original polynomial. Now, of course, w could occur many times. It could be a, a root of multiplicity bigger than 1. Now, if that happens, then you have an irreducible quadratic polynomial raised to a power that will be a factor of your original polynomial. But that, that shows what you wanted to show. 
It can be, the real polynomial can theoretically be factored as a product of irreducible quadratics and degree one polynomials. Okay, so that's, um, that's something to keep in mind. Now I say theoretically because in fact you're not able to find the roots. We, we can't find roots and we can't factor polynomials. If somebody gives me a, a seventh degree polynomial, I can't factor it. Unless it's a special one. You see, if it's simple enough, I can. All right, suppose that you have r of lambda equal a of lambda over p of lambda to the m, where a of lambda is a polynomial and this is an irreducible polynomial, all right, which means that you can't factor it any further. Okay, show that r of lambda can be written in this way. Okay, from the division algorithm for polynomials, see here I have this a of lambda. I can divide a of lambda by p of lambda and, and replace a of lambda by q of sub m of lambda times p of lambda plus p sub m of lambda, where this degree, this has smaller degree than p of lambda, or else it could be zero. So that leads to something of this form. And now I look at this. If the q, of, q sub m has a degree bigger than uh, the degree of p of lambda, I do the, exactly the same trick. And I just keep doing it until I, and that will deliver something like this. So I just continue doing this until I get something that looks like this. And then I have q2 of lambda over p of lambda. And if this is, has degree bigger than p of lambda, do the same trick. Divide p of lambda into it and write it as p of lambda times something uh, uh, plus, say, an L of lambda plus R of lambda, where R of lambda does have degree smaller than P of lambda. And then things cancel and you get an extra polynomial in there. So this is what you'd end up with is something like this. And so that gives you uh, the kind of thing that we're, that we're discussing here. Okay, now here is the method of partial fractions in general. Suppose you have a rational function. So these are both polynomials. Uh, show it's of this form where these are relatively prime. Degree of n of lambda is less than the degree of this. Okay, so um, how do we do that? <clears throat> well, usually when we see something like this, if the degree of a of lambda is bigger than the degree of b of lambda, we go ahead and do long division and write it as p of lambda plus n of lambda over b of lambda where the degree of n of lambda is less than the degree of b of lambda. Next, factor the bottom into a form that looks like this. Now, I, this was discussed in the book. You just keep factoring until you get something like this, and you can't factor any further. So the, all these polynomials are irreducible. And as I pointed out in the book, this means that if you look in, at any subset of these p sub i of lambdas, um, you, uh, that will be an, um, a relatively prime subset, okay? So, uh, that shows that you can do this, okay? So, if you have any rational function, you can always write it as a polynomial plus, uh, something like this. All right, or degree of n of lambda is less than the degree of the bottom. Now, um, let's go on and get to the, the full method. All right, so if you have a polynomial that looks like this, a rational function, then you can always um, write it as something that looks like this, okay? I want to argue that, in fact, I can simplify this further and write it like this, where the degree of each of these is smaller than the degree of p sub i. Okay, and this is just some polynomial. All right, since they're relatively prime, now this is the big trick. There are polynomials a sub i of lambda such that one is equal to these, this uh, combination. So what I'll do is I'll take this thing and I'll multiply by the by one in this form. Now of course over here that doesn't change anything. That's just p of lambda. I've gone ahead and written it as p hat of lambda because I'm going to be changing the, the polynomial as I go. Uh, but it, it, this won't really change. And then here 
I can split this up into a sum that's of this form, where I have n of lambda times a sub i of lambda. And then you see for the ith term, I'll have a p sub i of lambda here. And then I'll have a, a p sub i to the m sub i up there. And that'll cancel. So one of the factors in the product that I started with gets raised to a smaller exponent. So I get something like this. So this is of the form summation i equal 1 to m, all of this stuff. And then I do exactly the same uh, process. Uh, using the, that these are relatively prime, these uh, p sub i's and p sub j's, I can get 1 equal to this sum. I multiply by it again, or something like it again. And I split it up, and I keep on doing it. Now, eventually, this eventually one of these factors may disappear. Okay, p sub i may end up getting raised to the zeroth power. Well, when that occurs, in those terms, you use a different um, uh, combination that gives you one. Because remember, any subset of the p sub i's are going to be relatively prime. So I just keep on doing this, and eventually it has to stop. Because each time I do this process, one of these factors gets raised to a smaller power. So eventually it's going to stop, and then if you collected all the terms, you'd have an expression that looks like this. Now at this point, you look at these. If their degree, if the degree of this is bigger than the degree of p sub i, you do the little trick that I did earlier. You use the division algorithm and write it as something with degree smaller than p sub i added to a multiple of p sub i, cancel the p sub i, add another polynomial to this, and keep doing that until eventually you get something in this form where the degree of each of these polynomials is less than the degree of p sub i of lambda. So that's all you have to do. And that is the wonderful method of, of partial fractions. And you may be thinking, this looks impossibly hard. And it really is, because all this is, is tells you what to look for and why it exists. OK, so before I show you an example that shows that it's really not that hard, um, let's draw a little observation. Suppose you have a partial fractions expansion of something. And the degree of the top here is smaller than the degree of the bottom. Then I claim that this polynomial will have to be 0. Why is that? Well, because if I multiply through by the bottom, if this degree was not 0, I would have a polynomial on the left that would have degree bigger than the polynomial on the right. And that is not ever possible. OK, so this will have to be 0. All right, so let's do an example now. All right, find the partial expan fraction to expansion for this. Now, I'll just tell you, this is a fairly hard example. Most of what you'll see in calculus is going to be much simpler than this. But this, this is a hard one, and we can go ahead and do it. Now, the degree of the top is 7, degree of the bottom is 5, so divide the bottom into the top. Now, the bottom is equal to this. So I do long division, and that, after I've done long division, now how do I do that? Well, I have this here, and you notice how uh, I have this very, very long expression here. And notice how I had to include 0x to the fourth and 0x squared here, because this didn't have an x squared term, and it didn't have an x fourth term. So how many times does this go into that? Well, I put an x squared, because when I put an x squared there, I get an x to the seventh. And when I subtract, I get rid of the x to the seventh. And then I have a smaller, a, a polynomial of smaller degree. And so then I put an x there, and I multiply this whole thing by x, and I get this. Then I subtract, and I get 2x to the fourth plus the, all this gobbledygook. And uh, this, I, I guess we're done because this has smaller degree than this, so I, so I would stop. And so now the original uh, expression is equal to this polynomial plus this rational function that has degree of the top smaller than the, the degree of the bottom. So all I have to do is work with this one, all right? 
So I know it will have a partial fractions expansion of this form. That's what I just got done showing, right? So in this case, this is what we're going to have. We'll have the irreducible quadratic and its power uh, erased to the uh, second power. And then on the top, I'll have polynomials that have degree 1. And over here, for this polynomial of degree 1, I just have something of the uh, polynomial of degree 0 on the top, see? And I don't know what A, B, and C, D, and E are. But once I know it has the right form, once I know the form of it, then it's just a routine matter to find A, B, C, D, and E. And that's something that students sometimes get confused about. The big issue and the, the mathematically significant fact is that it has a partial fractions expansion of this form. The rest is you just do whatever is convenient to find these coefficients, okay? And there's no single right way to do it. All right, now if you, if you look for something that is in the wrong form, it does not matter how hard you look for it, you won't find it because it won't be there to be found. And it doesn't matter if you have a great attitude and, and all the rest of the nonsense people sometimes tell you. If it isn't there, you won't find it. That's the way math is. Okay, we're going to multiply by the bottom of the left side. Why? Well, it's just something that tends to work, so I'm going to do that. And if I do that, then I get that this numerator here, this top, is equal to all this stuff. Okay? Now, at this point, I notice there's an x here and here. So if I just assign x to be 0, this would all reduce to 1. I'd get an a, and I'd get a 1 there, so a is 1. Ah, I've made progress. So now, since a is 1, I will subtract this expression from both sides. Now, when I do that and simplify on the left, I get this is equal to this. And now you notice x divides both sides. So I will divide both sides by x, and then I get that this is true. And now I'll just multiply all this stuff out, just expand this expression. And now I match up coefficients. I have bx cubed here. I have an x cubed there. So I see b is equal to 1. I have a cx squared. I have an x squared there. c is equal to 1. I have b plus d. See, b plus d times x. There's a 1. So I have b plus d has to equal 1 plus d, because b is 1. So d is equal to 0. And finally, c plus e is 1 plus e, because c was 1. And so e has to be 2. So now I just have to plug in to this expression up here. And I see that this is equal to this. And so the original rational function is right here. Because I, I need to put in the polynomial that, uh, that occurred. And that uh, essentially finishes up chapter 1. So I will stop here.